just for anyone who doesn't know, I just want to make it clear that this was the timeline guy. <laughs> did you create a series of timelines for this investigation? I did. Okay. Uh, it sheds light as to understanding what happened. Um, and so what you're going to see is they're called linear timelines. That's because they happen in an order of operations in linear fashion. So on the left is the beginning and on the right is the end. And everything's going to have a, a date and a time. And then whatever the data point is, whether it came from the phone or it came from financials or it came from surveillance, um, whatever the data point is. January 25th is 1216 p.m. Uh, this is this is Saturday um, before Al flies to um, Oklahoma. So Saturday the 25th at 1216 p.m. Find real military singles researched. My name is Kevin Clark, and I am the director of the Crime Strategies and Intelligence Unit here at the Fourth Judicial District Attorney's Office in El Paso County and Teller County, uh, housed in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Fantastic. And people may know you from the Letitia Stark trial, which I'm sure was very difficult for you as well, and a lot of work that you did there. So just for anyone who doesn't know, I just want to make it clear that this was the timeline guy. <laughs> Sorry for the timeline for the guy. casual yeah. <laughs> language, but you were the timeline guy. We were all in awe of your timeline. So we're going to get to questions about that a little later. But what I'd like to know is, as a senior criminal intelligence analyst, how many hours would you say you work per week? And what does your day-to-day -day life look like? Sure. Um, so before I came here, um, I was a senior criminal intelligence analyst with uh, the Colorado Springs Police Department. Uh, in their Metro Vice Narcotics and Intelligence Division, uh, signed to this unit called the STIC, uh, the Strategic Information Center. Um, and it's, it's a full time, you know, at least 40 hours a week, depending on your caseload and, and what's going on, uh, at the city at the time. Um, and my job was to identify, uh, prolific, uh, repeat offenders, as well as provide investigative support using, uh, digital forensics, uh, analysis to whatever the case type might be. And uh, that, that's where I was at the time when um, I was called to uh, ask to support this case uh, and only this case where I just go TUI away from my normal um, office and just work out of the command post uh, for the next 30 to 60 days when, when this was uh, happening. Okay. And what is, in your job, your favorite software or resource that you use for your work? Um, so a pretty common uh, software is called uh, i2 Analyst Notebook. And it's... Uh, uh, IBM product, and that's what I use to make the timelines. Um, and it can also make link charts and organize uh, crime charts, um, toll analysis for cell phone analysis. Uh, it's a pretty powerful tool, and it just visualizes data. So I, I really like the I2 Analyst Notebook software. Um, and then for uh, tracking movements, like anything with a date and a time and a latitude and longitude, so you know, cell phones, apps on phones. Uh, vehicles, things like that. Um, we use a program called uh, GeoTime. And uh, you know, there's, there's a bunch of programs out there, but um, I, I like the way the GeoTime displays uh, visually uh, on the maps and, and the data points uh, that they use. And we do love map time over here. <laughs> I'm sure you know. Love that map time. And with your data that you provided, we were able to also put together just on Google Maps, that whole picture. I mean, what an incredible amount of data on your timelines. And I've since analyzed those little points. It's it must have taken long to make that. How long did it take you to make your timeline? So those timelines during the investigation, they were being updated daily, uh, almost in real time. Whenever a new data source would come in, whether it was um, 
surveillance uh, from a neighbor or a commercial uh, camera system, uh, whether it was GPS from a tracker that we placed on a car or the download of a car, uh, financials, um, you know, and of course the cell phones, things like that, the text messages, the calls, uh, it would just be updated in real time. And so um, kind of a military term, but it's called ops tempo uh, for you know, how, how your day is going, the, the operations uh, tempo. Um, we, we all worked essentially around the clock for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, we would all show up at the command post early in the morning. Um, and that's where I would brief what I found uh, overnight with whatever data source came back. And then uh, leads would be cut to um, whoever was assigned to the task force. They would go out and get them that same day, come back, and then round and round we go. I'd analyze whatever came back that night, and brief the next morning. We worked seven days a week, um, weekends, holidays, nights. Um, I would literally take 15, 20-minute catnaps um, on my uh, floor in my home office or when we're at work just out in my car in the parking lot um, and, and then get back to it. And everyone was like that. Everyone worked uh, the long hours to, to get this done. And... Um, you know, cases like this are few and far between for, for Colorado Springs. And so when something like this happens, um, it, it's not a nine to five Monday through Friday job. You you work until the job is done. Incredible commitment. And it's terrifying to think that one person caused all of that harm again. And, and then all the work that you all put into this and the time that you spend away from your families. All because of this one person. Do you consume any true crime content, podcasts, YouTube, anything like that? No, uh, you're honestly the first one. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you when you get home, you, you kind of you don't want to watch this stuff on TV. I, I know there's you know the shows, and um, in fact, you really don't even want to watch the news. You know, when you get home, you just kind of want to decompress a little bit. So, I, I'm really not a, a consumer of any of the, the true crime uh, content out there. My daughters watch it, and so that's how I I found you was. Uh, Lily, my, my oldest, uh, she sent me a text like, Dad, you gotta, you gotta watch this one. And it's when you're covering the, the Gannon, uh, trial. And so, uh, so appreciative of, of what you were doing and, and getting his story out there that, uh, that's why I'm happy to, to be here and, and talk with you. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And shout out to your daughter as well. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So when you first started putting the data together, did you already suspect that Leticia was responsible for Gannon's disappearance or did you piece it together as you went? So, um, you know, Gannon Gann was killed on Monday and I got the phone call that following Saturday, February 1st, asking if I would be willing to go to TDY, uh, temporary duty to, um, support Jess's case. And, and of course I said, you know, absolutely yes. And so essentially five days had already passed from the time he was murdered until when I started getting involved in the case. I remember she did this, um, interview with Spencer Wilson where she had her back turned to the camera. And I was at home watching it. Uh, I think it was a Friday night, right the day before I got called. And I remember turning to my wife and saying, uh, oh, she, she's involved, uh, only because um, she was referring to Gannon in past tense. And she's saying Gannon was, Gannon was, Gannon was. And that's something that we actually presented uh, for Dave Young's closing, was we would highlight uh, when she said was in that interview. Um, and that's just a subconscious thing that she did. And so I knew that she was involved um, in some form. Just didn't know if she acted alone or what her involvement was. Um, and then as the investigation progressed, that's where we knew she, she acted alone. Gannon is so kind and he loves to play video games. That's one of his favorite things. He loves Sonic and Mario. And, you know, he's always helpful. And I, he was always so helpful with the dogs around the house. And we have two little cute dogs. And he was always like a person I could say, Gannon, can you go do this? And he would do it right away. You know, sometimes with kids, we have to remind them and things like that. And that's okay. But he was so sweet and able to help anyone. He could notice when you're sick and say, are you okay? And such a kind heart. I mean, those stories were hard to follow initially, you know, with let's not trigger ourselves with all the Eduardo's and the, this one and the, that one. So I can understand, especially then as well, to know, did yeah, she have to learn and, or what and, happened? You know, what a lot of people don't understand is that um, every time she comes up with an ulterior suspect, um, we have to investigate that. We have to run that lead down uh, as much as humanly possible to either confirm or negate whatever story she's telling us at that time. 
Oh, man, she made a lot of work for you guys. I mean, even just for us on YouTube trying to follow all those stories just from the trial, it it was an incredible <laughs> untangling of stories. Can't imagine. With all the data that you're putting together as well. Wow. Okay. Um, while acknowledging the seriousness of the case, were there times when you had a little bit of a chuckle at some aspect of your research, for example, Letitia's Google searches or something else? Those Google searches were wild, right? Um, you know, and, and during trial, she is such a master manipulator. We had no idea what we were dealing with when we first started with this case. I've never come across anybody who can on the fly come up with a new story. Um, and we played some of the wire calls during trial, and I'm sure you picked up on it to where she'll go into great detail about the parts of the, the story that don't matter. But the most relevant piece, the part that we're trying to get at, that's where she does the yada, 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 whatever, whatever, it skips over it. And then when pressed, she'll come up with a whole new story and, and, you know, make you take a left hand turn in a whole other direction. And, um, that, that's what our first few months were like. It was, it was pretty wild. Um, you know, I never really got a, a chuckle. Um, you know, you're working under the duress of a missing kid that you're, you're hoping you can find still alive. And then once we found the amount of blood in the bedroom, you know, anyone who's done this job for a while knows that, you know, a, a young child can't lose that much blood and still be alive. Um, then it was time to get justice for Gannon. And so um, I think one of the things that I found kind of surprising was um, in her phone, when, when you download a cell phone, there's a uh, folder in there called uh, user dictionary. And what the user dictionary does is it counts how many words you use and then how many times you use that word. And so she had over 12,000 uh, unique words in her phone. And the number one most used word in her phone was the capital I. And, um, you know, I, you know, tell people that are in investigations that that's everything you need to know about, about the defendant in this case is that it's always about her. Um, some of the other things that I found strange in, in her phone, uh, were her photographs. She had, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs. And the only pictures of Jess Gannon um, were the ones taken that morning, that Monday morning where he's in bed. Um, all the other pictures of Gannon, he's either in the background or it's part of a selfie or he's standing with Harley or, you know, things like that. There's never just pictures of just Gannon by himself. Um, and so I, I found that kind of surprising, too. But, you know, it all it all plays into it, right? Exactly. And um, comparing then to maybe Lena, was she in any of the pictures then? Was it just Gannon that was then in the background or not really with her? Lena was in a few just by herself. Uh, okay. But, you know, I, I went through thousands of pictures and I never found one of just Gannon um, doing something at school or an activity at home or something like that. He was always, you know, uh, in the background or part of a selfie or with Harley, things like that. Yeah, that says a lot. And the eye, yeah, I didn't know that. Of, you know, it shows how, how she felt about him. Exactly, and herself with I, 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 I. And I'm sure the others were yada, yada, yada. Oh man. Uh, me, Emmy was also in the top 10. <laughs> wow. I, 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 and me, me, me. Okay. Yeah, that pretty much sums exactly. up <laughs> Letitia. Yep, that, wow. That sums up the defendant. Yep. Yes, yes. The convicted, the, convicted. <laughs> the sentenced, the forgotten. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How much data did you have to work through? And how did you choose what to put on your condensed timeline for the jury? Yeah. So um, during the investigation, um, when the timelines were printed out, they, they were about 150 linear feet. They, they wrapped around, uh, the command post twice. And, and, and the command post was this giant, um, meeting room, briefing room where we all had, uh, space to put our laptops and computers and the, the timelines were all hung on the walls and windows, uh, just wrapping the room. And at that time, um, I think there was just over 5,000 data points. Um, every single, financial transaction, text message, um, um, location, uh, GPS hit, it was all on the timeline. And that served two purposes. Um, you know, of course, it helps tell the story of, of what happened, um, but then also it highlights your intel gaps, where you need to focus uh, efforts on. And we, we learned very quickly that any time we couldn't account for uh, her physical whereabouts, we needed to focus in on that time and, and, and find out. And that's what led us to um, you know, the, the board up in uh, Douglas County, the S curve and um, uh, Florida trip and things like that. 
side question. Do you think that she moved again and from there in Douglas County because she thought that you were on her trail? Why did she do that? You know, the moving around so much. I'm wondering in your yeah, mind, what was that um, about? Very calculated. Very calculated. So that part of Douglas County, you don't just accidentally go there. You have to seek that place out. And especially where she hid Gannon um, for those few days, um, there's a little pull-off uh, that, that eventually goes to a uh, private driveway um, and then a, a little barbed wire fence that isn't very sturdy so you can get around it pretty easily. And so you don't just accidentally show up to that, to that spot. you you got to find it. And so um, what I think is that she realized that even though she put her phone in airplane mode, um, that we'd be able to figure out that her car went up there. And so um, she she put Gannon out there with the board, and then she came back to retrieve Gannon uh, the night before she left for Florida. And um, you know we we found evidence out there. We found the board, and it makes sense because that's just one more thing that she took with her. She would have to dispose of later. And so she left the board, and uh, probably hoping that we'd never find it. Uh, but but we found it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Everything she was hoping for. Nope, nope. You found it. Indeed. Yeah, we. it, it took all of us, but we, we put a really strong case together. We definitely did. Are there still gaps in the timeline that bother you or data that you wish you had? Sure. Um, for me, on that Monday, you know, you, you see them leave the house. You see Gannon kind of walking sluggishly and needing help getting back uh, up into the back of the pickup truck. And uh, then you see them go to, uh, you know, the, the pet store where there's you know, commercial surveillance as well as financial transactions. So you know for sure that that she was there. You don't see Gannon, but you see her. Um, and then she's gone for two hours. And then she comes back to that same store and, and buys another item. Uh, I've always kind of wondered where she went during those two hours. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there was no other financial transactions. So we, we couldn't see where uh, she went to look for more surveillance. Um, her cell phone was, you know, left at home, even though she sent that text to Al like 15 minutes before she actually left the house saying, Oh, I left my phone at home, called G's watch and they stay connected. You know, um, she, she did a good job deceiving us, uh, during that two hour window of, of wherever she went. So I've always kind of wondered where she went during those two hours. The piece of data that I wish I had, uh, would for sure be the, um, the surveillance at the hotel in Florida of her leaving at, you know, two in the morning to go uh, toss Gannon in the suitcase off the bridge. Um, I think that would have been, um, you know, if it wasn't for the NGRI part, if it was still the whodunit part, I think uh, that would have been extremely powerful. That would have, and there's no cameras on that bridge, right? Because that would have also been interesting then to right. catch yeah, her. We, we, we couldn't find a camera that, that um, would, would view that area. And then, you know, the hotel surveillance wasn't there. So, uh, luckily though, and this is, you know, my, Michael's are the best to where, you know, um, some divine intervention took place. Uh, that van that she rented, she didn't know that it had a, a built in GPS tracker and that GPS tracker would, uh, ping every six hours, but then it would also do this power up event to where, um, essentially every 24 and some change hours, uh, the tracker would, would power itself up a little bit. Uh, it's hardwired into the battery and that tracker pinged just over a mile away from the bridge uh, early in the morning. And so had she waited, you know, a half hour, um, you know, before or after leaving, uh, when she did, uh, the, the van would have pinged in the parking lot. But because she left when she did and because that tracker powers up every 24 and some change uh, hours, uh, we got the van right there uh, real close to the bridge. And did that help or was it also... By, by chance that the bridge inspector found the suitcase or did the ping actually help? So Macon, um, the bridge inspector, uh, that was another kind of mini miracle was that he went to go inspect that bridge when he did and that uh, he saw the suitcase and he took the time to go investigate that suitcase. Otherwise, we, we may never have found Gannon. Who knows? You know, um, and the timing of it all, um, we already had uh, Leticia in custody before Gannon was found. But once we were able to find Gannon, then that, that tied up of, of how he died. We were able to get the autopsy from the medical examiner and, and we learned you know, what, what happened in his, in his final moments. 
Were you shocked when Gannon was found in Florida? Had you anticipated a different outcome? I was just happy that we found Gannon, um, not just for the investigative side, but for his parents, so his parents, uh, Alan Landon, could, and the rest of his family um, could start that next chapter, knowing that he wasn't taken to Mexico or that he wasn't with some stranger or things like that. Uh, you know, I, I'm a dad. I've got three daughters, and that'd be my worst nightmare is thinking that they're out there at this exact moment being abused, being hurt, things like that. And so um, at least that puts that part of their mind at ease that Gannon was found and that he's no longer suffering. But yeah, I mean, it was 2,000 miles away. That's, I was worried that he could be, you know, anywhere between here and there um, and that he may never be found. Um, you know, the investigation had been going on for weeks at this point. Um, and so I'm, I'm real thankful that, that we did find him for, for numerous reasons. During your testimony in the trial, you were easily able to recall exactly when Gannon's birthday was. How did his case impact you? And did thinking of him get you through some of the worst days? This case impacted me pretty profoundly. Um, this was the largest investigation in the history of El Paso County. Um, I learned things I didn't know existed. Uh, Fakepolygraph.com, didn't know that existed. Um, we worked seamlessly between the Colorado Springs Police Department with their resources, the El Paso County Sheriff's Office with their resources, the FBI with their resources. Um, and at the end of the day, it was 22 law enforcement agencies had a part in this investigation um, in, in some form. And so um, being the lead analyst in all of this and kind of that, that hub of any time a data point would come in, it's my job to do real-time analytics on it, get it on the timeline, brief it to the bosses to get leads cut. It was a huge responsibility uh, and it was a lot of pressure. Um, and, and to be honest with you, um, it helps to not think about Gannon as, as the 11 year old boy and what happened to him. Um, you don't want to get emotional, um, at times like that. You, you want to stay logical. You want to think through the problems, think through the solutions. Um, but at the end of the day, um, there, there's a text message, um, from when Letitia was using Gannon's phone to message Landon. Uh, that night, um, Landon messaged back, find my baby, please. And I, I printed out that message and it, it was taped to my computer screen for the last three years. Uh, I just recently took it down. Um, and that kept me motivated and kept me focused. Um, even, even after Gannon was down, it, from, you know, find my baby, please, to, you know, let's get justice for, for their baby. Um, yes. and that's kind of what kept me motivated. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, these cases, um, they're, they're, they're hard. Yeah, I mean, they we all kind of unite in the heartbreak of it, you know, and for the family. And for me as well, personally, I always think of the victim and their families at all times. I'm very protective of them. So I, I can't imagine how you feel when you're literally looking for Gannon, but also watching the defendant, the convicted, the forgotten now, Letitia, <laughs> watching her every move and just trying to stay on top of it. It must and, be and a lot of pressure. games being played along the way. It was, it was so frustrating. Um, and I, you know, the term, uh, you know, Gannon's army, you know, out there in social media land, it's true. There were people from all over that, that were, were emotionally invested in this case. And, um, it, it took all of us. It took all of us to do what we did. And they, they suffered with us. They suffered the, the heartbreak, the, the frustration, the, the anger. Um, uh, you know, this really captivated a lot of people. Um, do you feel that justice has been served? Um, as much as possible in a Colorado uh, judicial system, yes. Um, she got life without the possibility of parole. Uh, she will die in prison one day. So um, from that aspect, um, for the family, knowing that their child's killer will never be free again, um, yeah, I think I think that's the best that we could we could do for from our chairs. In some recent trial coverage in a different case, we learned a lot about the difference between life without parole and death row. Not that I think you guys have the death penalty, right? No, we got rid of it um, right. shortly after um, Gannon's case uh, began. Uh, I think it was March of 2020, we, we did away with yes. death penalty. But um, life is still not easy, right? It almost sounded like the way they presented in the trial, like they get tablets and they get rec time and they get this, but it's not exactly enjoyable or easy, I'm sure, for 
life without I, I parole. I would not want to go to prison for life. No, it's just <laughs> not. It's not good. Um, you know, here in the United States, we, we treat our prisoners a little bit differently than other parts of the world. Uh, to where, yeah, some some institutions do give tablets and and rec time and, and swim lessons and things like that. But either way, you're still incarcerated. You know, you'll never be free. You're, you'll never get outside those walls and, and enjoy the things that you used to. And so the fact that we were able to take that away from her, um, it's, it's important. Especially the Kim Kardashian, she thinks she is, right? She's traveling <laughs> everywhere. Kim Kardashian with all her outfits. I'm a, what did she say? I'm so fashion or whatever. And she said I, she measured the window and will escape with a broomstick. I mean, <laughs> not really. Yeah, yeah. You know, Tisha did. She wanted to be a Kardashian. Um, when you go through her phone, it was very clear that she felt that uh, she deserved more uh, in life than what she was getting. And that may have played in a little bit of, uh, of her motive to do what she did. He had on a, we, he has several jackets. Like he might, it depends on, I'm, I'm very like fashion. So like it, it just depends on jackets. Like he might have this black one with this or there's a blue one with this. And... So he had a jacket. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Several jackets. Like I mean, you see the kid has, you know, like tons and tons of clothes and he just, you know. He has all that stuff, so. Yeah, the entitlement Absolutely. was de definitely there. It was real. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that entitlement was real. <laughs> um, did you ever cry or break down during your research, for example, when realizing the gravity and devastation of this case, even though I'm sure you've seen a lot of terrible things? Sure. Um, yeah, this 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 case, um, it hurt, and it, it, it still still hurts um, when I kind of reflect the back on what happened and, and, and what we did and everything that happened. Um, it, it still stings. It's going to be raw for a long, long time. Um, let me, oh, hey, here we go. Oh, nice. <laughs> You've got a grizzly true crime mug. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I still get a little bit emotional, so I need to take a second. Um, I'll never forget. Um, when I got the call again, it was found. And uh, we all went into the to the command post and they started sending in pictures of the scene. Um, that, was, that, was, that was one of my worst days. That was, that was really hard to see. Um, and, and everyone in the room uh, was, was affected. Yes, especially um, Macon Ponder. Was he surname Ponder? The bridge Macon Ponder. Ponder. Yep. Make and ponder. I mean, at first he was just curious and he thought, oh, there's a bag. And, you know, maybe, I mean, it sound, that sounded sad too. Maybe it's puppies. But to then realize what he had found and how, yeah, I can understand. I, I, I could not imagine what what that was like for him. You know, um, it's true, you know, when you're in law enforcement, you get a little desensitized to some things. Um, but at least we were we were prepped going into that room knowing what we were getting ready to see. I, I couldn't imagine. Um, what what making when he unzipped that suitcase um what that was like for him uh it, it, it must have been one of his worst days too yeah and i was going to say i hope that you know that we, we will all heal from you know the case even though we'll always be there for ganon but that i i mean it will never leave you the case will never mm -hmm. leave you and what you saw you can't unsee and you can't unfeel it and no, no one wants to we want to be there for ganon always we'll never forget him no Wow. No, I'll never, I'll, I'll never forget this case. No, again, in his family. How did it feel to present your timeline to the jury? Um, I was really stressed out. Um, I had to get it right. Um, it wasn't just presenting it to the jury. It was presenting it to the community um, and presenting it to his parents. Um, you know, for the past three years, uh, Alan Landon and, and the family, they're asking really good questions. They're asking really hard questions that, I was in their shoes, I'd, I'd want to know too. And in order to preserve the integrity of the investigation and then subsequent prosecution, there wasn't a lot that we could tell them sometimes. They had to just be left with, trust us, you know, we'll, you'll, we'll be able to tell you later, but we just can't right now. And I couldn't imagine what that's like to be a parent and, and, and hear that. But um, for them to, to say, okay, um, and have their trust, uh, it meant the world. And so, um, you know, to present it, um, to show them everything that we did, and, and that was the condensed timeline. Um, it meant a lot. And, and on a, you know, something on a personal note is 
we would meet with them regularly uh, as much as we could even during the trial. And in the days leading up to to my part, uh, being the last witness and, uh, and doing the timelines, um, I pulled each of them aside, Alan Landon, and um, I said, you know, no matter what happens at the end of this, I hope that you know that I did everything that, that I could uh, for your son for this investigation. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the things he said to me will, will stay with me the rest of my life. So um, it, felt, it felt good to be able to share to the jury and, and to the community what happened. And it felt good that um, the jury didn't buy her uh, not guilty by reason of insanity and, and convicted her. And so to be able to have even just a small part in that, uh, it, it means a lot. I think it was more than a small part. Your timeline, especially as the final witness, was like, <laughs> good luck arguing that. This was a huge investigation. I mean, you know, 22 law enforcement agencies, the, the room was packed. Sometimes there's standing room only for some of these briefings. And um, it, it was it was wild. Um, and then some of the stuff we dealt with along the way, not only with all of her lies, but, you know, you may remember the PC affidavit got leaked at some point. And, um, you know, her, her wanting to represent herself. And it, it was just, it was, I've never dealt with anything like this in my career. It was crazy. Was it a strategy to keep your timeline as the final witness, for you to be the final witness? Was that like, you know, keeping that strength in the pocket till last? It was. So, I mean, you saw how many witnesses we called. You know, we called close to 80 witnesses. Not all of them live here. So the logistics, you know, our, our paralegals and legal assistants, getting these people out here and getting them in the lineup, that was a whole other thing that happens behind the scenes. And so, you know, thank goodness we've got rock stars to, to make all that happen. Um, things went very, very smoothly um, during trial uh, from that aspect. The problem is when, when you have an investigation this big and you have this many witnesses, is that you can't do it sequentially, right? It's not like a linear, like my timelines were, where you have a beginning and you have an end. Um, the jury heard, you know, DNA one day, and then they heard, you know, wire calls the next day, and then they heard, you know, um, cell phone stuff another day. And so it wasn't in a way that could be easily understood if you've never followed this case, if, if you weren't familiar with this case, which some of the jurors weren't. And so to hear this for the first time, um, you know, it's tough to understand where all these pieces of the puzzle fit. And so the strategy, um, you know, and my hat off to, to Michael and Dave and Angelina for, for doing this, was to put me a blast with the timeline. So that way they, you know, saw and heard everything over the last five weeks. But then now they understand why it's important and how it all fits together. Um, and so I, I thought that was, that was a good move. And, you know, we, we've done that before in other trials. Um, I did that in the um, Kelsey Barrett homicide uh, you, you, you may remember that when she was the mom that went missing on Thanksgiving in 2018. We did the very same thing. Uh, Jen Beeman was the prosecutor in that one. And we did the timelines at the very end, just kind of wrap it all up to make sense for the jury there. Okay, it sounds like I'll have to deep dive that case too. I don't really know much about it. <laughs> and I'll have to have a look at your timeline. So were you also one of the final witnesses there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. With a comprehensive timeline. I mean, it just it was just brilliant, especially after all the the Dr. Lewis stuff and everything like that, <laughs> the the defense's yeah. strategy. When you came in with that timeline, I mean, everyone knows for me on my channel, I just I love presentation time, map time, timelines, and just that was, we were all in awe, myself and, and it, my community. It was so important because if this was a case of who done it, I all day, every day, we get the conviction. I had zero, um, zero stress. But when she entered that NGRI, the, the not guilty by reason insanity, all it takes is for one juror to say, you know what, this this isn't normal behavior. This is crazy. I think she is crazy. And then, you know, it, it ends in a hung jury or, you know, it, you might have to do it again. But uh, so a little concerned when, when that was entered. Um, but luckily they, they saw through Dr. Lewis's testimony and they saw through uh, the defendant's behavior uh, during trial and things like that. So we knew when that camera was on, um, when, when the the trial was being streamed, there was a little light on the camera that was on uh, the judge's uh, bench. And as soon as the light went off and the jury was, you know, uh, excused for a break or lunch or end of day or whatever like that, and the judge would step off the bench, the show was over. She'd stand up, she'd be talking and laughing and eating and drinking. And, uh, you know, but then when, when the judge would come back in and, and the court was called to session and the camera would come back on, right before that, she'd sit down and 
pull her hair down in front of her face and you know it, it was all a show and it was, oh, it, was man. it was very frustrating just sitting feet away from her and having to to watch that and then i could feel what al and landon were, were enduring also with those shenanigans so it was wild. I can't imagine that just seeing because we obviously just see the on camera. I can't imagine seeing that that she's preparing for her. I don't know what look she's going for there, but how she was on camera and then just yada 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 when the camera's off. Like what? Yeah, yeah, wow. Exactly. I'm sure none of us want to hear those words ever again. <laughs> when no, now someone that, says that it, I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've listened to those um, wire calls and jail calls and and. So sitting there, um, you know, I just kept telling myself, hey, this will be the last time you have to hear this. I'm just hang in there. This will be the last time you have to hear this. It was pretty painful, even even all, all the way to the end. Yeah, for us more than once, I think it was. <laughs> it's pretty torturous, yep. So that was actually my next question. How did it feel to sit in the courtroom with Letitia right there in front of you as you exposed lie after lie after lie? Honestly, I was hoping that the jury was able to to follow. And, and we had a really smart jury, so, so it worked out. Um, but to my point about her being a master manipulator, even when I was on the stand and I was going through her Google searches, she was trying to manipulate the jury, not just with, you know, her hair in front of her face and all that. But um, you probably recall when I was reading the, the worst of the worst Google searches, they started making a lot of noise over there. She was getting louder and louder with her giggling and laughing and, and uh, her movements with pointing at the laptop. And um, that's just manipulation. She was trying to cause a distraction uh, so the jury would pay attention to what she was doing and not listen to what I'm saying up there uh, because she knew. She knew how bad it was. And so, um, you know, it felt it felt really good uh, when, when we got that conviction that her tactics all the way from the beginning to the end, uh, not one of them worked. If you didn't know, you came across as incredibly confident it's almost like you you just knew okay here we go with this timeline here we go Letitia <laughs> and then this <laughs> and this so I know you said you were stressed but you didn't come across that way it was just like bam <laughs> like still here nervous. we go <laughs> I was still nervous and I've testified you know another homicide trial um you know unfortunately this wasn't my first child homicide but I was so nervous um that day I don't know if it was because um you know, I knew it was being live streamed or, uh, you know, because the, the prosecution team, you know, you got the, the district attorney, you got Dave Young and Angelina Gradiano, you know, all rock stars. Um, but yeah, I was, I was, I was a ball of nerves up there. So if I came across, uh, collected and confident, that's, that's awesome. Thanks for the feedback because I was. No, you did like focused wreck. and strong and just like, here we go. Confident. Let's, let's do the timeline. We were so? like, wow. So are there any I, I, mysteries that remain in Gannon's case for you? And if so, do you think they'll always remain a mystery? I, I have to say the, the, the candle, the candle incident. We'll never know what happened. Um, unfortunately, there's only two people who know one of them's no longer with us. And the other one, you know, even if she told us, we, we wouldn't be able to believe her. Um, there's evidence that there was, you know, a small, I don't want to say fire, but, but something did burn, um, in the carpet. There was melted wax on the couch in that horrible cell phone video that she, she made. Um, you hear Gannon crying and he's, you know, worried about the burns. Um, so something did happen, right? We'll never know if it's true that, that, you know, Gannon lit a candle and it tipped over on him. Or if she, if she did something more malicious, um, we'll just never know. Okay, because you weren't in here, you weren't in here in the beginning, right? I thought I had, I didn't know if I had that box cutter and all that stuff in there, because I told him about he dropped a candle last night. Oh, okay. And I was, I thought I must have picked it up. I was just making sure I didn't want you to be like, oh, just a box cutter. But yeah, I had to cut this, and I told them I wasn't even going to tell Dad, and I was going to figure out a way to put this in there <laughs> from the situation, but. It's At least you got like a carpet. Yeah, yeah. Right. I just took it and like covered up with the carpet and stuff like that. But what I do know is that from everyone that we talked to, Gannon doesn't just go downstairs and light a candle. Uh, and that's just not him. So I, I don't know. We'll never know. Um, but um, as far as everything else, you know, we found him and then we found how he, how he died. And so um, for me, that's, that's, you know, closure enough uh, with the with the guilty verdict for that case. 
Is there anything of interest that you'd like to share that was perhaps not in your condensed timeline or just about the case? Um, so, yeah, the condensed timeline, um, as, as the investigation and then the prosecution evolves with time and as the information becomes available, it sheds light on what's important and what's not. Um, when she entered the NGRI, that kind of changed the strategy a little bit because it's no longer a who done it. It's she's saying she did it, but she's saying that she was insane when she did it. And so we have to flex to that. Um, that that strategy um and so with that the jury doesn't need to see every fast food stop that she went to between here and, and myrtle beach you know every financial transaction where she got gas where she stayed the night things like that we we condensed it down uh we knew it was going to be a full day maybe a day and a half um, and, and that's a lot that's a lot to keep the jurors attention for that long um data point by data point by data point and so we, we got rid of a lot of stuff that we just didn't need, uh, with the NGRI. During the investigation, one of the key pieces, um, back when there was the, you know, Eduardo story and Quincy Brown story and things like that, um, we, the house had an ADT alarm on it. And, uh, there's motion sensors upstairs and downstairs and there's sensors on the doors. And, um, that came into play, uh, in two events. Uh, the first one was when she said that, you know, there's a big fire and she, she rushed everyone out of the house and got into a car and drove down the street. That didn't happen. Uh, none of the sensors, uh, doors weren't opening, doors weren't closing. Um, fire alarms weren't going up, nothing like that. The other part was when it came to the whodunit part. Um, when we see her and Gannon leave in the red truck and then go to the pet store and then wherever, um, during that time, the motion sensors were inactive. There was nobody in that house during that time. Doors weren't opening or closing. There was no movement upstairs or downstairs. And so that helped negate her statement that someone was in the house waiting for her when she got home. Um, just not true. Um, and so that, that was a pretty critical piece during the investigation. Uh, again, of, of, of the, the whodunit piece. Once it became the NGRI, we didn't need to, to show that data because it, it just wasn't important anymore. The, we already put the Quincy Brown and the Eduardo thing to rest. Um, the other um, really important piece was the telematics from the Volkswagen Tiguan. Um, she drove essentially 45 minutes north to hide Gannon. Um, and so that was our, uh, you know, we had the crime scene of Gannon's bedroom. And then we had the crime scene of the Tiguan where she uh, put him in the suitcase and put him at the airport all day while she rented that little car. And and uh, uh, then later that night when and hit Gannon up in the forest. Uh, but the T1 um, brought us to the third crime scene, which is that S curve up in Douglas County um, off South Perry Park Road. And um, as an analyst, um, what you do is you evaluate the data. You go through and you look for source, reliability, and validity. And then you make, it's essentially an educated guess, uh, as to what you're interpreting the data as. And, um, I'll never forget, um, we're searching for Gannon and we're searching for evidence down in the Lawson Ranch area. It was still under construction at that time. They're still building houses. And so we were looking, you know, at foundations and there's always little storage sheds out there and there's a, a Johnson Reservoir is down there. So we're focusing most of our efforts in that area because most times you're going to recover evidence at or near the scene of, of where the homicide occurred. Um, I'll never forget, she puts her phone in airplane mode, so she's off the cellular network, so we can no longer get data from um, AT&T. She goes up to the S-curve to hide Gannon, but her Volkswagen was recording with a date, time, latitude, longitude uh, every few seconds. It would just create a little breadcrumb trail of where it went. And we watched her go drive around um, up north uh, into a, another housing area um, that was under construction. And so we thought that she might have put it in a dumpster, put the suitcase with Gannon in, in a dumpster. So we went searching out there, and the types of dumpsters they had, they were really tall. And so she wouldn't be able to lift, um, you know, an 85-pound bag up over her head and into these dumpsters. So we, we did do a, a landfill search, 
in the fact that we got kind of lucky in that all those construction dump, uh, dumpsters, they don't go straight to a landfill. They go to like a transfer station. And uh, we, we got on it fast enough to where all the waste from the transfer station hadn't gone to the landfill yet. And so we were able to search and, you know, of course we didn't find anything because nothing was ever placed in those dumpsters. Um, but once you went to the S curve, we measured out, um, we, we saw the vehicle go north and abruptly turn and come back down south. And that's abnormal behavior. You know, there, there's no need to do that. And so we put a time component to it and we saw that it took about five minutes longer for her to come north to south than it did for her to go south to north, meaning that she loitered in the area for those five minutes. Um, you know, these guys that I work with, um, the, the task force, these are, these are my, uh, you know, friends and, um, the best of the best. Uh, and so when I had to tell them, Hey, I think we need to move search operations essentially an hour north, um, in a different jurisdiction, having not found anything where we're currently searching other than inside the house. Um, that's one of those moments to where when, when they asked me, are you sure? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah. Yep, I'm sure we need to do it. And, and they did it. Um, meaning that they trusted me. That, that's also something that, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. It means the world to me. And thankfully it paid off because again, as an analyst, you don't want to be wrong. You don't want to lose credibility. You don't want to waste time and resources, especially under the duress of, of a missing child. And so I was out there when we found that board, when Sharkitty found the board, um, me and my FBI counterpart, uh, it was a weekend. We went out there just to kind of go see how search operations are going. And, uh, they had, um, avalanche professionals out there with these poles, uh, cause we had, we had a ton of snow and it was up to your waist in some parts. Um, and so they're out there with the poles and they're out there with, um, sifters sifting through, through the snow and they found hair. Uh, it turned out to be horse hair. Um, but ju just that level of, of, uh, dedication, right? And then um, Sharkitty found the board and uh, tested positive to Gannon. And then it became a case of, okay, we found the board. Where, where's Gannon? And so we thought, you know, hey, maybe, you know, wildlife got him. But we talked to some wildlife experts and say, if that's the case, they, they usually spread, spread things out. So we'd find a sock or a shoe or, you know, something. And we didn't find anything out there. So we knew that he had been moved. And so kind of going back to your other question of, you know, was I shocked that he was found in Florida? Um, no, not not really. I knew it was somewhere along that route, but to be able to search over 2,000 miles, you know, of, of a road, nearly impossible. So I'm just grateful that he was found. Um, and uh, you know, the, every every little data point uh, was meaningful in this case. It all played a part into telling the story of what happened again. I love when criminals forget that <laughs> all the the little data points, you know, that, that will catch them in the end. Right. Thank goodness they forget about that. Yes. Nice, nice mug you got there. <laughs> it's, it's good. I love grizzly mug. <laughs> Coffee just tastes better out of this grizzly mug for some reason. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for getting that as well. <laughs> but the sure. board, do you think that was just to lift the bag? Because everyone was wondering during the trial, what is it with the board? What is she, was she doing with the board? Is it to make like a ramp to the car? Is it to put the bag out there? What is What was that all about? So, um, Gannon bled a lot and Gannon was bleeding through the suitcase. We found blood trails, you know, um, in the storage room that went across the room where she hit him underneath the boxes. Um, when you look at, at the body cam from the initial response at night from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, um, you see the boxes in that storage room arranged a certain way. And then when you look at the CSI photos, they're rearranged. And that's because, and we, we have blood evidence on the floor, uh, to, this she hid him underneath all those boxes um and then she moved him after uh the sheriff's deputies cleared uh she moved him uh into the tiguan and then parked the tiguan at the airport for the day now with that he you know bleeding in, in the suitcases leaking and so there's blood um you know throughout the house through the laundry room leading to the garage in the garage we see where she set the suitcase down momentarily probably while she is getting it into the back of the car. And so Al was a woodworker, or is a woodworker. And uh, there's, um, you know, you have, you have scrap wood laying around from the woodworker. 
And so she found that board that would fit in the back of the Tiguan um, and she put the suitcase on top of it um, probably because she knew that we'd search the car and she didn't want us to find blood evidence in the car. And that also explains why she went and washed the Tiguan before she showed up for her, her interview on that Wednesday before she you know, came up with the, the assault story and all that. And so, yeah, no, the, the board, you know, it's made out of like this MDF particle board. It wouldn't hold. If you try to use it as a ramp, it would snap. Um, it wasn't used for any of it. She didn't hit Ganon with it, nothing like that. It was solely to just uh, absorb the blood leaking out of the suitcase so it wasn't in the car. Um, and then, like I said, she, you know, she, she put Ganon out in the forest and she threw the board out there, um, likely co-located with the suitcase for those few nights. And then when she went to retrieve uh, Ganon in the suitcase, she left the board there because it would just be one more thing she had to get rid of. Or one more thing she got to explain to anyone who saw this board uh, that she's loading up, you know, like her brother in you know, Dakota, he said it was really weird how heavy the suitcase was that she was loading in a van and she didn't want him to touch it. And uh, she told him there's softball gear in there. And, you know, imagine how do you explain away a board covered in blood, you know, that you want to bring with you across the country. So uh, that's why he's left behind. How do you manage to find balance in your personal life when there's so much work to do, for instance, to, you know, prepare your timeline and everything you do? How do you find the balance? That, that's the secret, right? You know, if anyone ever figures it out, I'd love to know because um, you can't do it all. Um, something's something's always um, going to lose. And so what you got to make sure is that you don't keep disappointing the, the important people in your life. And so I'm, I'm really lucky that uh, my family, my wife and three daughters, they know that every now and then um, there's going to be a case like this and it's like a mini deployment where you just have to, you just have to work it. And, um, they understand, you know, they understand that it is, you know, a child and, and it's, you know, there's something that we knew or cared about, um, or one of our children, uh, you wouldn't want the people who could do something about it to be taking nights and weekends and holidays off and things like that. And so, um, I'm really lucky to have their support. Um, cause it was, it was, it was I'm a veteran, uh, I deployed multiple times, uh, to Iraq and other parts of the Middle East and, uh, it was like I was gone. Um, you know, I try to have dinner with them a couple times a week, um, but it's hard. And so something's always got to give. And so what you have to do is once, once you're done with, with that part, you know, once, once we got to the point to where we filed charges and, uh, the ops tempo could ramp down a little bit, then it was time to kind of start spending a lot more time with the family, um, and, and recovering there. Uh, you know, your personal time. You don't get to go to the gym as much as you want or, or do things that you enjoy because other things take priority, you know, and, and so um, it's, it's, it's a balance and it's hard because you always feel like you're letting someone down. You know, you don't want to let the victims down. You don't want to let your boss down. You want to let your family down, you know, and then you don't have time for yourself to where you just feel you know, stressed. Um, and so the little bit of free time you do have, you don't want to be selfish and, and take it and, you know, it's definitely, it's tough. It's really tough, but it's, it's the job. It's what comes with it. Um, and so, yeah, again, I, you know, I give a shout out to my, my wife and daughters because they, they towed the line for those few months while I was, you know, working around the clock. I'm real lucky because there, I know some people who don't, don't have that. And when your home life's falling apart, it makes your work life that much more worse. Yeah. So <laughs> much so, more stress uh, and pressure. It was a lot of pressure. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a lot of pressure. And what keeps you motivated through the tedious work that you need to do? Because I'm sure there's a factor of lack of sleep and maybe lack of exercise. And so what, what keeps you going? Um, you know, I, I told you that I printed out that text message um, from Landon saying, find my baby, please. And that was, that kept me going a lot. Um, but in, in general, it's a unique responsibility to be the voice of a victim who lost their voice. And uh, I take that responsibility very seriously. And so um, when it comes time for, for cases like these, uh, I hope there's never another one, but that's just not the world we live in. Um, I, I, I just, I do the best I can. And what's next for you? What's next for me? Um, I'm going to be here for a few more years. Uh, I enjoy this work. I find value in it. I think it's important. Um, I've had a, a wild career. Um, I got my start as a small kid in a small town, um, and I wanted to be a firefighter. And so I got on uh, the fire department as a firefighter EMT, uh, one city over from where I grew up. I did that for a few years. 9-11 happened. 
uh, I wanted to serve my country and, and, and to be honest with you, just get revenge, uh, for the 343 firefighters that died that day on 9-11. So I joined the Air Force. I had a real lucky day. Uh, you, you take this, you take this test called the ASVAB and depending on how well you score on this test depends on what kind of job you can get in the military. And I did pretty good on it. And so the recruiter was like, we've got this, this Intel job in the, uh, Air Force intelligence and specialized in signal intelligence. We have all this crazy James Bond gadgets and stuff like that. Like, sign me up. Let's do this. Uh, and that kind of opened the doors for, for everything else that came along. Um, multiple deployments, um, during Operation Iraqi Freedom and during Freedom, things like that. And, uh, uh, I learned a lot. I learned, uh, specializing in signals, intelligence or SIGINT. Um, you learned a lot about how, um, communication devices work. And that's kind of played into my role with, uh, the Colorado Springs Police Department and in my role here at the DA's office. Um, when we got to, Colorado, we decided we want to make this place home, and so I was honorably discharged, and I was a defense contractor for a couple of years. Um, and then I found my way to um, the CSPD in the Metro VNI, and that was some of the most rewarding work I've ever done, uh, working working in that office uh, with some of the brightest people I've ever come across. Just they got a lot of talent over there. And then when uh, Michael was uh, elected DA. Uh, he wanted to um, start up a uh, crime strategy unit, an intelligence unit here at the DA's office. So I put in for it and I got it. And this is the first time this has ever been done uh, here at the Fort Judicial. Um, and so I'm in the next few years, I'm going to continue building this unit, uh, capabilities, products. Um, and then from there, who knows? Like I said, the universe has a strange way of getting you where you need to be when you need to be there. Yes. And two questions about lessons. Number one, yeah. what lessons do you think we could um, learn from this case? Like, I, I mean, like safety lessons or, you know, what what could the public learn from this case? Um, well, I guess the first one would be don't ever take your loved ones for granted, right? Al I had no idea that was left. I mean, he'd be saying goodbye again that, that afternoon he left. Um, but from a public safety lesson, um, I have all of my location services on, on my cell phone and stuff like that. I'm not worried about the government tracking me. I'm not worried about, you know, worst case scenario is that my location data is sold to third party, uh, for, you know, billions of dollars. So someone's getting rich off of my Google searches and where I go when I'm there. But if something ever happens to me, um, it'll, it'll make it easier to find, to find me. And so, uh, you know, if you have children that, you know, ride the bus to school or walk to school or things like that. Um, there's apps that um, make all the difference in missing child cases. So anything that, that you have with the location service, um, it, I, I, it's all my kids when, when they were younger um, and, and my youngest right now, uh, they have them on uh, just for that exact reason. You know, the world can, can be a kind of a rough place. It's not a safe place as it used to be. And uh, something ever happens, you know, you, you don't want to be like, oh, I wish I put this app on their phone or I wish, you know, um, I put, you know, this device in their backpack, uh, things like that to, to help find them. And my second question with lessons would be, I know you don't spend much time on the Internet consuming the content, but how can content creators of true crime cover cases responsibly and with empathy? Um, so Judge Warner said it best. Um, there was a day in trial where there seemed to be a lot of noise from the galley. Uh, people pulling out cell phones. It's kind of like a lot of conversation in the back. And, and he said it best where you need to keep in mind that this isn't a TV show. People don't go home at the end of this. There's a real victim involved here. And, and, um, this is their life and this is what they're going to live with for the rest of their lives. And just to kind of show some concern that, um, sure, the most horrendous stuff might get the clicks or get the headlines and things like that. But, um, we still need to be respectful and understand that that this was a person and, and horrible things happen in this case again and and that the family's trying to heal and um, you know for, for the content creators um, don't make it any worse than what's already been for them. Any message that you have for me or the Grizzlies that you'd like to include in this video? Um, thank you for this opportunity to be able to help tell uh, Gannon's story. 
Um, thank you for, for covering it and telling, uh, you know, I, I know you're across the ocean, so, you know, the world, um, what happened to Gannon. Um, keep up the good work. And, um, you know, I, I hope I hope our paths never cross again. Um, but uh, I think you do a really good job with the way you present uh, these cases. Thank you.